In our second lesson on carbohydrates, we'll be looking at the cyclization of sugars. Recall from our last lesson we could represent the structure of a carbohydrate in linear form as a Fischer projection, illustrated here on the far left. However, it would also be appropriate to represent it as a cyclic molecule, known as the Hayworth projection, illustrated in the center of our slide. Notice the double-headed blue arrow, indicating that there is a dynamic equilibrium between the linear and cyclic forms. This is an important consideration in the reactivity of carbohydrates, as we'll see. Notice in the Hayworth projection, there is a thick line illustrated between carbon-2 and carbon-3, and this is meant to indicate that the structure is nonplanar. We can see this more readily in the chair conformation on the far right, and this is the most accurate representation of the three-dimensional structure of the molecule. As you can see, a kind of a twisted molecule, not planar or flat. For our purposes, we will focus on the Fisher and Hayworth projections, and you want to be comfortable with switching between the two forms. Let's take a look and see how that cyclization occurs. Here's the Fischer projection of D-glucose on the far left. Our carbonyl group is highlighted in blue, and our penultimate hydroxyl group in red. Recall that the oxygen atom in the hydroxyl group carries two lone pairs, and that makes it an excellent nucleophile. The carbonyl carbon, because of the electron-withdrawing oxygen atom, carries a permanent positive dipole. Nucleophilic attack, then, occurs by the oxygen atom attacking that carbonyl carbon. In order to see how the cyclization occurs, we're going to lay the molecule on its side, rotating it 90 degrees clockwise, and as you can see, it's as if the tail bites the head. Once the oxygen attacks that carbonyl carbon to form a covalent bond, we have a cyclic structure. Now, because there's free rotation in that carbon-1, carbon-2 bond, nucleophilic attack can occur in one of two positions. If it attacks in one position, the hydroxyl group that forms at carbon number 1, highlighted here in blue, is below the plane of the ring, and we call that the alpha anomer. If it attacks in the opposite position, the OH is above the plane of the ring, and we call that the beta anomer. The easiest way to distinguish these is to remember that beta, batter up, the OH is in the up position. We call these anomers, and the carbonyl carbon that carries the oxygen atom that will become the hydroxyl in one of these two positions is known as the anomeric carbon. Notice the double arrows here, indicating the molecule readily converts between the linear form, the alpha anomer, and the beta anomer. So in a solution of glucose, all forms would be present. In the case of D-glucose, the beta anomer is more stable and would therefore be the most prevalent form. This can be more readily seen in a chair conformation of beta-glucose, though we do not have it illustrated here. Notice also the position of the OH groups as we switch between the Fisher and Hayworth projections. If the OH is on the left in the Fisher projection, it will be up in the Hayworth projection. If it's on the right in the Fisher, it will be down in the Hayworth. This is because we, in essence, rotated the linear molecule 90 degrees to the right and then cyclized it. That anomeric carbon is always bound to two oxygen atoms. Clearly, it's easy to recognize the anomeric carbon in the linear form, but a little bit more challenging in the cyclic form, and this is the easiest way to recognize it. So if I didn't have these carbon atoms numbered, you would simply look for the carbon that's bound to one, two oxygen atoms, and that's unique to that anomeric carbon. Any other carbon, here's carbon number five, it is bound to one oxygen, but it's bound to two carbons and a hydrogen, not to two oxygens. Now you'll notice in the case of glucose, since it's the penultimate OH that attacks the carbonyl and that carbonyl is position number one, we form a six-membered ring. That's referred to as a pyranose ring. Look at fructose on the right. Remember, this is a ketose, and so our anomeric carbon is carbon number two. And so if we use that 
Number 5 carbon, the OH, to attack that number 2, we form a 5-membered ring. That's a furanose ring. When you first look at the cyclic structure for fructose, it looks symmetrical. You have to look a little closer. And again, here's our anomeric carbon, carbon number 2. It's bound to 1, 2 oxygen atoms. If we look at carbon number 5, it's bound to 1 oxygen but a carbon here, a hydrogen, and another carbon here. So only that anomeric carbon is bound to two oxygen atoms, and that's the easiest way to recognize it. In our next video lesson, we want to see how carbohydrates can be modified and what makes them so chemically reactive. We also want to define what is a reducing sugar.